Hey, what's up, Abe's fifth period? Are you ready to party? It's Tay Sizzle. It's Parnizzle. It's Serenizzle. It's Melodizzle. It's Trish Zizzle, and this is chapter 11, pages 294 to 300. The surviving Siberian tigers, I call them surviving because almost every other tiger in history has died. These Siberian tigers are also called Amir tigers. These tigers are now becoming less populated because these Russian guys walked into their land and killed a whole bunch of them for fun, and it became a sport. They're called poachers, and the tiger population dipped in 20 to 30 animals. Wildlife Conservation Society is just trying to save the following number of tigers. They do this with cool gadgets like collars that could tell you how the tigers died and their health, and it's just pretty rad. These techniques, or methods, whatever you want to call it, save roughly 330 to 370, and about 1,500 survived in zoos and captive breeding. Biodiversity encompasses several levels. Species are disappearing off the face of Earth. Biodiversity is the sum of all organisms in one area, consisting of their genes, their populations, and their communities and ecosystems. Species is defined as the largest group of organisms capable of interbreeding and producing fertile offspring. In biology, a species is one of the basic units of biological classification and a taxonomic ring. The characteristics that are used to classify species are based on common ancestry and the ability to interbreed. The number or variety of species in the world or in an area has two components. Species richness, which is the number of species, and evenness or relative abundance, the extent to which numbers of individuals of different species are equal or skewed. Locally, factors such as immigration, emigration, and local extinction affect species richness. Taxonomists, the scientists who classify species, use an organism's appearance and genetic makeup to determine its species. Similar species are grouped into genera, then families, and so on. Species are given a two-part Latinized scientific name denoting its genus and species. One example is the tiger, Panthera tigris, which differs from other large cats like Panthera onca, the jaguar, or Panthera pardus, the leopard. As you can tell by their Latin names, these animals are related in evolutionary terms. Here we're going to be going over genetic diversity and how scientists categorize subspecies by learning about the genetic differences in the individuals from different populations. If you don't know what a subspecies is, it is a taxonomic category that ranks below species, and it is usually a race that is geographically isolated. The definition of genetic diversity is the difference in DNA among individuals within a population, or species. Taxonomists classify organisms using a system of hierarchy that places species that are similar in their appearance, behavior, and genetics in the same genus. The steps of the system go down like this. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. An easier way of remembering it would be dumb kids playing catch on freeways get smashed. Having a lot of genetic biodiversity allows for species to easily adapt to changing conditions, and populations that have more genetic diversity often have a better chance at surviving in changing environments. For example, a diversity of genes for coat thickness in tigers allowed for natural selection to favor genes for thin coats of fur for Bengal tigers that live in warm regions and thick coat genes for Siberian tigers that live in much colder regions. Populations with little genetic diversity are much more vulnerable to extinction since they are not prepared for any environmental change. Populations with little genetic biodiversity may suffer from inbreeding depression, which is when genetically similar parents produce weak offspring. Cheetahs, bison, and elephant seals are prime examples of species with low genetic diversity that have dropped to small population sizes in the past. Little genetic diversity is not only a problem in animals, but also in our our crop plants, as diminishing genetic diversity in our crops is becoming a huge problem for a growing population. Moving on to ecosystem diversity, this is the number and variety of ecosystems. Biologists may also refer to the diversity of biotic community types or habitats within some specific area as ecosystem diversity. If the area is big, scientists may consider the geographical arrangement of habitats, communities, or ecosystems, including the size and the shapes, in order to figure out ecosystem diversity. For example, the seashore of rocky or sandy beaches or cliffs, coral reefs or ocean waters, hold much more biodiversity than a monoculture cornfield. 
Also, a mountain slope whose vegetation changes from top to bottom would hold much more biodiversity than an area of the same size consisting of only one biome, such as a desert, forest, or meadow. Some groups hold more species than others, and this is because species are not evenly distributed among taxonomic groups. Taxonomic groups are what I was talking about earlier. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. For example, the number of insects in the world is much more greater than any other form of life, and 40% of all insects are beetles. J.B.S. Haldane, who was a 20th century British biologist, once said that God must have had an inordinate fondness for beetles. The process of adaptive radiation has given rise to many species in a short period of time, while others have become separated by barriers, and this is called allopatric speciation. If you don't remember what allopatric speciation is, it is when a group is separated geographically to the point where they can no longer mate with each other. Other groups have accumulated species through time because of low rates of extinction. From the definition measuring biodiversity alone, which is very broad, it is clear that no single measure of biodiversity will be adequate. Biodiversity cannot be captured in a single number. For this reason, scientists express biodiversity in terms of species diversity and, in particular, species richness. However, we still are ignorant of the number of species that exist worldwide. Today, scientists have identified and described 1.7 to 2 million species of plants, animals, and microorganisms, although estimates for the total number that actually exist range from 5 million to 30 million. Our knowledge of species numbers is incomplete for several reasons. First, some areas of Earth remain little explored. Second, many species are tiny and easily overlooked. Third, many organisms are so difficult to identify that ones thought to be identical sometimes turn out to be multiple species. Across our planet, living things are distributed unevenly. Areas closest to the equator hold the most species richness. This concept is called latitudinal gradient. There is more plant productivity in those areas and then can therefore sustain a much larger and diverse group of organisms. In fact, equatorial areas are about as full and diverse as Mr. Vo's shoe closet. Stable temperatures and rainfall keep all the organisms in check and keep one species from dominating another. These conditions favor mostly generalists over specialists because the conditions don't vary. Tropical areas also contain a more even population as opposed to high-latitude biomes, and habitats such as forests can accommodate a very wide variety of niches. As well as that, ecotones also support an extremely diverse population because the habitats intermix and in turn increase the biodiversity. Lastly, human disturbances, as we have learned, can often halt, alter a habitat and occasionally can improve the habitat by increasing biodiversity. This is called habitat heterogeneity. This has been the Zizzles, and we is peacing out.